Hello, I'm Gerald Winslow. I'm the director of the Center for Christian Bioethics at Loma Linda University, and with me today is Dr. Karen Labax. Professor Labax and I first met when she was a junior professor at the Pacific School of Religion and the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, and I was a beginning doctoral student. She had just finished her PhD from Harvard University. She did her undergraduate work at Wellesley, and she had come to Berkeley as a faculty member, and that's where we met. Uh, Dr. Labax, welcome. Thank you very much. It's a joy to be here. Today we're going to interview uh, Professor Labax regarding her work with the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects, and I know it has a much longer name, we may get into that, but it was established in the early 70s and began its work just about the same time that you came to Berkeley. Is that right, Karen? Just about. I started teaching in Berkeley in 1972. The National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research was established by an act of Congress in 1974 and conducted its work between the years of 1974 and 1978. So the two years I spent in residence with you uh, studying these matters was right in the middle of, uh, really kind of at the beginning of the time of the commission's work. I think that's correct. Now, I, I'll admit to being curious. Here you are having just graduated with your PhD from Harvard. You're a very junior faculty member at this school. And, um, and you're chosen out of the hundreds of millions of people who could have been chosen to serve on, I think, an 11 member commission. That's correct. You want to offer any surmise as to how you were chosen for that? I think that I know how, but I confess I'm not sure. But I believe that the original invitation went to my dissertation director, Arthur Dyke, at Harvard. Mm -hmm. One of the first things that the National Commission was charged with doing was evaluating research on human embryos and fetuses. And Arthur Dyke was known for his support for the life of fetuses and his concern about the research. And I'm sure that he was originally invited and that he is the one who arranged for me to get the invitation instead because I had written my doctoral dissertation on the subject of prenatal diagnosis and selective abortion. I, I'm just now remembering all of that. And, and that leads to a, another question that um, I think I'd like to ask right at the beginning, and that is, what was the context historically? I mean, why was there a national commission at this point in history? Um, I can think of other times when it might have arisen, but here it is in the early 1970s. What prompted the nation uh, to have a national commission then? I think there were at least three things that really stand out historically. And they were three instances of rather egregious research on human subjects. One of those was the uh, Willowbrook studies where school children were deliberately infected with hepatitis without the knowledge or consent of their parents. The second was the long-term and particularly horrific study of poor rural black men from the South in Tuskegee where the men were allowed to go their lifetime with syphilis untreated even after treatments became available. So this long-term study where nobody was offered treatment when it came available, that was a second one. And then the third one that was at least for me a very important and egregious example of research was multiparous women who already had a number of children and had gone to a clinic 
for birth control, and they were randomly divided into two groups, one of which got birth control and the other of which did not. They were not asked to give their consent to participate in research. They all thought they were getting treatment, and needless to say, some of them who very deliberately were trying not to get pregnant again, some of them got pregnant. So those three examples, at least, I know are behind the development of the National Commission. And that's important because this was not a commission simply to explore research on human subjects. The name of the commission was the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research. So the commission's mandate was to establish rules and regulations that would protect human subjects from being used in egregious examples of research, from not being permitted to withhold consent or to say, I don't want to be part of this, and so on. What can you tell us about the other 10 commissioners on the 11-member commission? Was there an attempt to try to find a balance in terms of ideology or um, ethical commitments or a balance politically? Or uh, wh what can you tell us about that team? <laughs> it was an amazing group of people. That's the first thing I can tell you. I do feel very privileged that I had the opportunity to serve on this commission, not just because I was, as you have noted, a very young scholar um, who really had not established myself at that point, and it gave me in many ways my the beginnings of a career in which my name became known far beyond what it would have otherwise. But I also felt very privileged to serve on the National Commission because of the quality of the people on that commission. We were a very diverse group. There were two of us from the field of ethics. Albert Johnson was the other ethicist on the commission. So he representing Roman Catholic tradition and me representing Protestant tradition. We had several lawyers on the commission. We had um, several doctors on the commission and then several community representatives. So I think the balance was, uh, I think the attempt at balance had more to do with professional fields, locating people whose expertise might be important to the task of thinking about protecting human research subjects. So I don't know if it was an intentional political balance, but it was certainly intentional that we had this incredible range of backgrounds and perspectives. And if I may just tell a little anecdote here, one of the things that was the most difficult about working on the commission was that none of us spoke the same language. I mean, in theory, we all speak English, so we understood what each other said, but in practice, we really didn't. And uh, The physicians would use language that was not familiar to those of us in the field of ethics. We kept talking about how we needed to find morally relevant criteria, and finally, the physicians got so annoyed with us, they just said, we don't know what you mean by morally relevant. You need to define this term for us. We ended up up asking a scholar to write us an entire paper defining what constitutes moral relevance and when something is morally relevant and not. So a lot of the materials that came out of the work of the National Commission were not necessarily produced by the Commission itself. For example, the Belmont Report, which we will discuss in a few moments, is a very short document. This is it. It's 20 pages or 23 pages, or it looks like a graduate student's first attempt at a paper. But there are two appendices for that that are gigantic. And these appendices are not, as, as you sometimes expect, an appendix to be all of the accumulated data that supports the conclusions that are in a report. That's not what these appendices are. They are a lot of the commissioned papers that we developed in order 
to help each other share a language. And when we first started our work on the National Commission, it was very popular for people to talk about therapeutic research and non-therapeutic research. And ultimately, we ended up getting rid of that language. We did not use it. And the very first segment of the Belmont Report, which is our most famous report, the very first section of that report tries to define what is research, how does it differ from therapy, and why is it not helpful to use the terms therapeutic and non-therapeutic research. But we were doing all of this trying to find a common language while we were given four months in which to produce a very controversial report about doing research on human embryos. It, <laughs> it was quite a task. I think we met eight times, seven or eight times in those first four months. And I took to calling it my 48-hour red-eye special. I would teach during the week. On Friday night, I would hop on an airplane, fly overnight to Washington, DC, sit through meetings all day Saturday, all day Sunday, and get back on an airplane Sunday night and fly back to California to teach again the next week. Well, let's come back to your mention of the shared language. One of the things that's probably most noticeable and most durable, I would say, about the Belmont Report is that um, it, it focuses on and it's framed in terms of three principles. And I think anyone who works in research has needed to memorize those probably at the start, although I notice that they're often not understood per particularly well. So the three principles, um, I'm, I'm not going to name them, you know them well. How did the group come to the three principles? How did they come to a shared understanding of them? Um, talk to us a little bit about the, those famous three. Right. Part of the mandate of the National Commission was to, quote, identify, close quote, the ethical principles that should underlie research on human subjects. That word identify is important, and that's why I put it in quote marks. We were not to make up principles, but to locate and identify relevant principles. That task of locating basic principles went on all during the time that the Commission was working on our various other reports. We wrote reports on research on the fetus, research on children, research on prisoners, research on people institutionalized in mental institutions. We wrote a report on psychosurgery, which was also part of our mandate. But all during the time that we were looking at these particular contexts in which research is done, we were also trying to develop an understanding of what these basic principles are. Now I have to tell you that if you read some of the materials that have come out since the time of the National Commission, you will find several different versions of how the principles came about. You will find, for example, that Tom Beecham who had been working with James Childress on the development of their book on principles of biomedical ethics and was engaged at one point to be a consultant and then ultimately a staff member to the National Commission. If you read his version of how the principles came about, you will find that he says basically the commissioners were totally befuddled and would not recognize an ethical principle if it walked up and slapped us in the face. Um, on the other hand, if you read Al Johnson's version of how those principles came about, you would find him saying that we had been consistently looking at this issue around the edges of our other work. And finally, in about 1976, we convened a meeting at the Belmont Center, hence the title, The Belmont Report. There's a beautiful conference center um, that's called the Belmont Conference Center, or it was, I don't know if it still exists. 
And we met there for a long weekend to work on this issue of basic principles. We did, in fact, develop a list of seven principles at that meeting, but that was our first attempt to codify or identify what the principles might be. We put those out, we discussed them. Um, the task of putting shape to some of our conversations was always turned over to commission staff. All of our meetings were recorded, in full, transcripts were made, the transcripts were sent to every member of the commission, and our staff took those transcripts and tried to make sense out of what we had said in our various arguments with each other, because we did argue a lot. That's the nature of doing work in ethics. You, you don't agree with everybody. So um, the staff would take what we had done and then try to render it into a report that would come back to us. Then we would argue about it again, send it back to the staff. And this process went on from 1976 until 1978 when the Belmont Report was finalized by the Commission. So the, the final shape of that report does depend a lot on the work of the staff. And Tom Beecham was the major staff person who did the writing of the Belmont Report. It differs, interestingly, from the principles that Beecham and Childress um, promulgate in their very famous best-selling book on principles of biomedical ethics, and differs in several ways. The, the National Commission came up with three principles. The first one we called respect for persons, and we intended it to be a principle that requires respect for every person, no matter what their mental capacity, no matter their stage of life, no matter whether they are in prison or out, no matter whether they are dying or not, every person is deserving of respect. So that was our first principle. So I, I do want to give credit to Tom Beecham for doing a lot of the drafting of our report, but one of the places where he and the commissioners always disagreed was about this first principle, which we called respect for persons, and we intended that to include every person, not just autonomous persons. When you take that principle and you narrow it to respect for autonomy, then you have to ask, is there not to be respect for those who are non-autonomous? And there's a huge range of people who are not autonomous, children um, to begin with, and that was one of our more controversial topics that we dealt with, research on children. Anyway, we intended there to be respect for every person at every stage of life. Then the question becomes, what does respect require? And certainly where there is autonomy, we thought respect required attention to that autonomy and permitting people to make decisions whether they would participate and to permit them to withdraw at any time that they were uncomfortable with a research project. That gets a little tricky, but we'll talk about that later. But when you have people who are not autonomous, such as children, or possibly some who are mentally ill and are really incapable of making certain kinds of decisions for themselves. They still have to be respected. And we said what that requires then is additional protections because they are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, so th that was our first principle, and it's broader than, than I think it's sometimes understood. Mm -hmm. Our second principle was beneficence. We put beneficence and non-maleficence together. We said not harming is a part of this general principle of doing good. Personally, I don't agree with that. I like to separate out not harming as a separate principle, and I think it should be a stronger, more stringent principle than the principle of doing good. But the commission, it, it was, 11 very diverse people. We had to compromise with each other. That's the nature of that kind of public policy development work. 
So we compromised on calling it beneficence and having only three principles instead of four. What I am most pleased about in the work of the National Commission is the focus that we gave to questions of justice, which was our third principle. Prior to the National Commission and part of the work that we did trying to identify principles, there was the Nuremberg Code that came out of the egregious research done in Nazi Germany. There was also the Helsinki Code. We looked at both of those codes. The Nuremberg Code says very strongly, the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. There's that respect for autonomy and, and in my view, again, it's broad because it has to include the voluntariness of the subject. And the Helsinki Code did a lot on issues around beneficence, making sure that research is well designed so that you will get good results out of it, for example. There is no point in putting anybody to any risk if your research is not well enough designed that you're going to get some good generalizable results coming out of it. But what was really missing in the literature prior to the National Commission was the kind of focus on justice that we brought to bear. Now, in all honesty, we brought that focus to bear rather narrowly. Remembering that our mandate was protection of human subjects, we focused the question of justice largely on whether one should include or exclude certain categories of subjects that we thought were particularly vulnerable. Um, for example, people who are mentally ill and inside institutions are living in total institutions that have control over their lives. And if they are involuntarily committed to the institution, they have very little say about anything in their life. They're very vulnerable. So a, a justice requirement would be that you try to do your research first on people who have more freedom, more autonomy, and are not so constrained by their environment. I think since the day of the National Commission, and particularly because of the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s, the concern became that not only were we protecting people, but we were maybe overly protecting people and not permitting people to be subjects of research. And this came about partly also because there is so little data about how women respond to some diseases and disorders and to medications. If you do all of your um, pharmaceutical research, for example, on healthy young men, and you develop your dosages based on that subject population, what happens then when you turn to women who are either young enough to be potentially pregnant or old enough, as I am now, um, to be perhaps more frail. It's not clear that you can use the same dosages with the same effect. So th there was a lot of concern in the feminist literature that the National Commission was too protective and was so narrow about allowing research that it did not encourage other groups of subjects to be part of the research and that that in the long run might actually jeopardize some people's health. Well, this uh, opens to, a, to me an interesting question and that is as you look back over the years, what would you do differently about those principles? Um, Others have offered critiques of the Belmont Report. You're aware of uh, those, many of them, no doubt. And uh, you've probably offered your own critique, I suppose, as the years have passed. Um, what would you say about that now? Uh, with Now we have nearly four decades uh, to look back. Right. The Belmont Report consists of three sections. The first section tries to distinguish research from therapy 
and develop a language that could be used commonly in the research community that is more helpful than the language of therapeutic and non-therapeutic research. That section, I think, has stood the test of time fairly well, and I want to give credit there to Robert Levine from Yale University, who was a consultant to the commission. He was not a commissioner, but he was a consultant to us the entire time that we were sitting, and he was exceedingly helpful on all matters dealing with medicine, and also a very insightful person about the ethics of healthcare. Um, so that, that section, there are criticisms of it, and interestingly to me, some of the most cogent of those criticisms have come from our colleagues to the north. The Canadians have suggested that in trying to separate out research from practice, the National Commission ignored too much the arena of what some would call innovative practice or what some would call experimental medicine. That there always are people using a drug that was developed and approved for one indication. They use it for a different indication. Really what the National Commission said is if you're going to do that, it should be part of a research protocol, not just a, an experiment with one patient to see if it makes that patient better, because there are too many other variables. Create a careful research protocol and do the research to be sure that this, in fact, is going to do good for people for this other indication. So that's the first section of the report. That hasn't gotten as much press as the principles, which are the second section of the report. And then the application of principles is the third section of the report. I want to say a little bit about the principles and my own sense of what I might do differently there. Um, I have already indicated that I would support having principles, but I think that's important to say because there was also a movement in the field of bioethics, I think around the 1980s, maybe into the 1990s, to say, we're tired of principles, the principles are too rigid, it's too hard to know how to move from principles to cases, and really what we need is either casuistic reasoning where you start with the cases and just move intuitively in some fashion from there. There are a number of criticisms that have been raised that say the National Commission never told us how to balance these principles. You didn't tell us whether we have to meet all three of the principles or whether it's okay if we just meet one or two. My answer to that is you have to meet all three of the principles. I think there's no question about that. And after the commission had finished its work, at one point several of us got invited to go to a prison that I will not name because they continued to have a research program where they were doing some pharmaceutical testing on prisoners. We had addressed those issues in our report on doing research with prisoners because, again, there is a captive population. These people are in a total institution. They don't get to choose what they eat or what they do. Their days are regimented, and they have no choice of getting up and walking out. So we were extremely careful about what it would take for a prison to qualify to be an institution where research could be conducted. When the commission had finished its work and several of us were invited to go to this prison and look at their research program, as soon as we walked in the door, I looked at one of the men, uh, one of the administrators of the prison and said, you have wasted your money bringing us here. Read our report. It is very clear that you do not meet the criteria. So that for me is um, an important instance in which we took so seriously the protection of vulnerable people. 
that you can't just say, well, we're meeting this principle or that principle and we ignore that one. You have to meet all three principles. That would be my answer to that. But certainly there's been criticism and there have been suggestions that some of the principles should trump others and so on. Um, so, so that's one. A place where I would do things differently now, I would do several things differently, but one place where I would do things differently is in the principle of beneficence. We talk about doing good, and it is certainly the foundation for all medical research. You are trying to do good. You're trying to develop knowledge that will lead to new cures, that will lead to people being healthier and happier and better off. But that word beneficence carries a little bit of the connotation that I know what is good for the other, and so I am going to do good for that person or to that person. It has a bit of a paternalistic ring to it. Coming as I do <clears throat> out of a theological tradition, not just a philosophical tradition, I am more comfortable with a word such as compassion, which comes from the Latin compatior, which means to suffer with. So I think we need not only to be beneficent and doing good for others, but first to try to really understand what their suffering is and what it would mean to do good for them from their perspective, because their perspective and ours might not be the same. So you, you mentioned, uh, Karen, that um, there were arguments among the commissioners, and um, having met some of them, um, and including the rather colorful chairperson of the commission, as I remember him, uh, I can imagine some of those arguments. Did any of them become intractable? Were there any people on the commission who said, well, I, that's one step too far, I can't go with you there? Almost. Um, uh, first of all, I want to say we were so wise in our choice of a chairperson. Kenneth Ryan was a very strong and competent leader, and he led us through a morass of some very difficult issues. But yes, we did argue with each other, and um, one of the nice things that happened for me on that commission, Patricia King was a lawyer, African-American lawyer, on the commission, and she and I would often sit across the table from each other, and when somebody would say something, our hands would go up simultaneously. We would look at each other and kind of go, do you want to take this one or shall I? Because we knew that we were going to make the exact same point, albeit perhaps in slightly different language, since her field was law and mine was ethics. So I, I found it wonderful that there were people whose thinking resonated with mine. But there were also people who did not agree about things. We had some folks on the commission who I think would have permitted a lot more research, uh, been a lot more lenient about research than some of us were. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we had people, for example, who said we should never permit any research on a child unless that research is designed to benefit that child's own health. What we ultimately did as a commission was to draft reports or to permit our staff to draft reports which they brought back for our further argument and then approval. And we did sometimes approve a majority report and then have several commissioners write their own dissenting opinions, which became part of the permanent record and part of the report. So we were not always able to agree on everything, but we made a valiant effort to agree because the most of our reports, the reports on research, on embryos research, on children research, on uh, mental patients research, on prisoners, those reports were to be promulgated as regulations by the then 
Secretary of Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, now Health and Human Services. And that was clever on the part of the, the um, congressional bill that brought the commission into being. A lot of ethics advisory committees have no power. They just make pronouncements or they write reports and those reports go into a file and nothing ever happens with them. But the law that brought the National Commission into being specified that our recommendations had to be published for a specified period of time for public commentary and then they either had to be put into regulations for research or the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare had to specify publicly the reasons why he had not promulgated regulations for research based on our reports. So there was, there was a bite built into the work that we did. It had teeth in it, not thanks to us, but thanks to the congressional bill that brought us into being. That also then gave us the impetus to try very hard to agree with each other so that we would have a report that could be turned into rules and regulations for research. Otherwise, you could just have a whole bunch of academic people making pronouncements and writing papers and filing them away in a library somewhere. But we had more impetus to agree with each other and to try not to have too many dissenting opinions because of the fact that our work had this bite built in. I've been curious. Um, as you've watched this come to life in the regulatory world and in its application in research settings, I don't know how much contact you've had with those settings. How do you feel about that from, uh, from your perspective? What's your assessment of it? Has it played out in terms of its application in the ways that you had hoped it would? I think you would probably really have to ask the researchers to get the best answer to that question. But I can say this, not all of our reports did ultimately get turned into regulations, but most of them did, including and perhaps significantly our report on institutional review boards and the necessity for them. Uh, to be sure, like every other part of our report, that has received criticism. Um, people now worry that institutional review boards just rubber stamp research, that they don't really focus enough on protecting human subjects, that it's too rigid a system, and so on. Um, I think there's some truth in that. I mean, giving informed consent does not in and of itself protect a research subject. Really what we need is very sensitive, I don't mean personally sensitive, I mean professionally sensitive researchers who understand the significance and are dedicated to protecting human subjects and to thinking about what that would mean in the particular circumstances in which they are working. So any rules and regulations never do the whole job. I would be the first to admit that. But I am pleased with the fact that so many of our regulations did get into the Federal Register that becomes the document that any institution that gets public funding must attend to in order to get that public funding. Another criticism that was raised of our work, um, and understandably so, is that nothing that we did had much impact on privately funded research. But that wasn't our purview. We, we were not asked to um, promulgate rules and regulations for privately funded research, but only for publicly funded research. But it does raise very difficult issues. A lot of the in vitro fertilization clinics, for example, around the country were privately funded and their research did not necessarily go through the kinds of review nor meet the qualifications that would have been there had they been subject to all the rules and regulations that came out of the work of the National Commission.
So one of the complaints that one might sometimes hear in the ap about the application of the rules is that once they become bureaucratized, I'll use it that way, and, and made more formal in terms of great specificity, it's easy to wonder whether this is actually protecting human subjects. One, one part of that is just the incredible length and complexity of the consent forms, sometimes pages long with technical terms that the typical person and even, and even a highly educated person in the field might not fully understand. That's one part of it. The other, the other the anecdote I wanted to give is uh, we're showing a film, um, happened to be Atul Gawande's Being Mortal. The funders of that wanted to have a survey afterwards about how people felt about the film. So the result was filling out several pages of forms to protect these human subjects who of their own accord came to watch a film on a midweek evening and then chose uh, freely to fill out the survey. Um, and you can imagine how at some point people like myself might wonder, well, is that what the National Commission intended? <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> and it is, you used, I think, very wisely the term bureaucratization because one of the things that has happened over time is that this fundamental concern to protect human subjects then gets turned into a rule like you have to get informed consent rather than asking, is this a circumstance in which there would be any risk to subjects? I mean, couldn't they get up and walk out of the room if they don't want to stay and answer questions about the film? So I think now uh, most universities do have certain categories of research for which informed consent forms are not needed. One of my concerns, and, and this I do not lay at the door of the National Commission, but at the door of the development of the field of bioethics since then. One of my concerns is that our wonderful principle of respect for persons got turned into a much smaller principle, respect for autonomy, I mentioned that earlier, and in addition then, respect for autonomy got turned into a rule that you have to get informed consent. From my perspective, that is a narrowing of the subject in ways that really are not helpful in some, in some circumstances. So for example, what happens to research where it is not just this person, your subject, who might be at risk, but where the subject's community might be put at risk. When you do genetic research, for example, or when you do certain kinds of psychological research, um, you suppose you want to do a study to show some fundamental difference in the way that men and women think. Mm the subjects might perfectly well sign an informed consent form, I'm willing to be part of this. But is there not a potential risk to the larger subject pool about whom conclusions will be drawn from this research and that subject pool had nothing to say about whether this research should proceed? We have several classic instances where research, for example, on violence, on violent tendencies, got stopped because a community said, you are not going to do this research. The way you have set it up is prejudicial to inner city communities. It is prejudicial to black communities. We will not permit this research to go forward. So there's a community dimension to research that frankly was completely ignored by the National Commission. We, we, we weren't trying to ignore it, but we were under a lot of time constraints and we did what we could. Many people have criticized our work also because it seems to be primarily based on a biomedical model, not on a behavioral research model, even though our technical title included both biomedical and behavioral research. And they are correct. 
we never did some of the work that should be done around behavioral research and how to protect subjects from behavioral, um, in behavioral research. But we could not do everything with the time constraints that we had. Um, as it was, our work extended beyond its original tenure. I think it was supposed to be two years. We ended up taking four years. We met every month um, in Washington, D.C. as a commission with each other. And that doesn't include all the field trips that we did in between, um, which I'd actually like to say a little bit about, sure. if I may. One of the reports that, that was the most difficult for us was research on prisoners. And the reason for that is that most prisoners, unless they are mentally ill and therefore confined in a special kind of prison, most prisoners would be competent adults. They may have made some bad decisions in their life, but they're still competent adults. And they should be able to make an informed decision about participating in research. But because they're in a total institution, they're also very vulnerable. They don't have a lot of options. And one of the things that we became concerned about is whether there could be undue influence on the decision making of prisoners. The irony in all of this is that when we went around to the different prisons where different kinds of research were being done, without exception, the prisoners there said, we love the research program. It is the place where we get treated with the most respect. So there we are with prisoners telling us we want this program and it is a place where we get treated with respect. We really have better living conditions. We get better food. It, every, the, I, I think at root the, the concern for them was that the care that they got from the medical staff who might be giving them you know, the, the various and sundry um, pharmaceutical strips to see if they had allergies and, and things like that, the care that they got was so important to them that we he hesitated to take that away from them, yet they were a vulnerable population. One of the prisons that we did visit was Jackson State Prison in Michigan. And that is a maximum security prison. And so our staff had to work extremely hard to get permission for us to go to the prison at all. And we, the commissioners, had insisted that we thought the prisoners would not speak honestly to us if the guards were present. We insisted that we had to have an hour in a room with just commissioners and prisoners. And I think there were only 10 of us who did that trip. I, I'm not sure, but I think there were only 10 of us. So 10 commissioners surrounded by 25 or 30 prisoners in a room with no guards. A perfect opportunity to be taken hostage, a perfect opportunity for the prisoners to act out in violent ways or whatever. I never felt safe that day except the hour that we spent in that room surrounded by these supposedly violent prisoners. The rest of the day, everywhere we walked through the prison, there were guards with guns aimed at us. And I did not feel safe at all except when we sat and we talked to those prisoners. And they were, most of them, lifers. They were going to be in that prison for life. They talked so helpfully to us about what they experienced in prison and what it would take to make it an environment where they could genuinely give consent to participate in research, that that significantly affected the work that we did ultimately on that subject. So I have been grateful to them ever since. I also had what at the time I called day mares, where visions from that day would come crashing back into my brain at various and odd moments of the day. And I think today we'd probably call it post-traumatic stress disorder, but I didn't have that language then. Um, it was a very painful experience, some of the things that we did. Um, mental institutions, prisons, 
They, they, were, they were hard places to visit and to try to keep a focus on the work that we needed to do. But we learned a great deal from doing that, those field trips. But they were also in addition to our regular meetings. <laughs> well, uh, I remember being on the one um, in Walla Walla, as you mentioned, and Walla Walla isn't a place that's on the way to anywhere else, no. so you, you really have to want to go there. I also remember interviewing individual prisoners separately so that we could get a sense of how they might really feel about it if, if not, um, if they didn't feel like they were under surveillance. And um, that was very telltale because, as you mentioned, they were very supportive of the work that was being done there, even though it was a behavior modification program yes. that um, people had severely yeah. criticized. And which, in my view, sadly closed down uh, not too long after the commission went there. I thought it was a wonderful program and should have been a model program, but um, there are differences of right, opinion. Right. Well, somebody commented to me once, when it, if, if we injure someone in terms of um, medical research that, uh, of the type that would, say, injure you in your physiology, anatomy, we might have a chance to fix that. But if we injure you psychologically, we often don't know what we did or, or what we would do to, to fix it. So um, I think that is a, yes. a, an ongoing concern. Yes. Um, so what, one thing I wanted to know, were there highlights for you personally as you look back on it and say, you know, that was very special to me personally for, for my own development or for whatever reason? Definitely. Um, I, I really want to stress again how fortunate I feel to have been permitted the opportunity to serve on that commission. It was very difficult work. I, I think for the four years that I was on the commission and still carrying a full-time job elsewhere, I really had two full-time jobs during that time, basically. Um, but I feel so privileged to have had that chance, not only to work in an interdisciplinary context, which is so important in the field of bioethics. And that was really my first extended experience of being able to do that. But also some of the people that I met, Patricia King, whose work I admire so greatly, um, Robert Levine, who was our consultant for the four years, and with whom I subsequently did a great deal of collaborative writing in the field of bioethics, especially around issues of informed consent. Through that commission, I got invited to contribute to a number of volumes in bioethics that otherwise would probably totally have ignored me. I was um, young both chronologically and professionally. I was teaching at a small school that was called a school of religion. Um, not the kind of, I mean, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't a philosopher from, you know, the University of Pennsylvania or, or from Stanford or Harvard or one of those places. Those are the people who are generally more likely to be invited to do things. I got invited because of my work on the National Commission, and I have been forever grateful for that. And I'm also very sure that it was my long-term friendship with uh, Bob Levine that led to my being invited to be the bioethicist in residence at Yale about 10 years ago for a year. So I spent a lovely year at Yale being overworked again after I was supposed to be retired. <laughs> I have flunked retirement several times. <laughs> I have yet to try it yet, <laughs> but um, well, Karen, thank you for taking the time. Um, it's been an enjoyable hour for me to remember these things. Uh, we're in your debt not only for the interview today, but as a nation, we're in your debt, along with the other commissioners, for shaping the way we still think about research f now more than 40 years later. Mm -hmm. I think that's a remarkable achievement, so thank you for that. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here and to have a chance to think back and talk a little bit about the work of the Commission. Thank you for that.